A recent paper by scholars from Imperial College, Dartmouth, Princeton, and the University of Pennsylvania found that 67% of science Nobel Prize winners have fathers from above the 90th income percentile in their birth country. The authors claim that their paper shows extreme inequality in the science world and that they're undiscovered geniuses from poor backgrounds who never got the chance to show what they could do for humanity. The study commits a jumble of statistical and conceptual errors that make its findings meaningless. There is no evidence in this paper that unequal opportunity in science limits human progress. The study got plenty of press attention, such as a piece in The Guardian, which claimed that the paper showed a lot of talent wasted and breakthroughs lost. The Nobel Prizes highlight that we have a biased system in science and little is being done to even out the playing field, wrote scientist Kate Shaw in Physics World. We should not accept that such a tiny demographic are born better at science than anyone else. Science isn't about what we should accept, but about what is true. So how did the authors determine who was born better and thus had a leg up in winning a Nobel Prize? The study looked at what their fathers did for a living. It found that since 1901, people with scientists for fathers had 150 times the chance of winning a Nobel Prize than the average person. Scientists earn more on average, so this allegedly shows that coming from a wealthier family gave these people a boost. But it's common sense that the children of scientists will have an advantage in winning Nobel Prizes. Children of successful people often excel in the same fields as their parents. The size of the advantage may seem surprising, but this is typical when you look at the extremes of the bell curve. Even small initial advantages can result in extreme differences in outcome. Suppose instead of Nobel Prizes in science, we were talking about an Olympic gold medal for the 100 meter dash. Suppose everyone in the world got to participate. There would be thousands of people a step or two behind the winner. Now let's suppose that 10% of the population, say anyone with a left-handed mother, had started the race with a two-step head start. The average runner with a left-handed mother would be only two steps ahead of the pack, but we can almost guarantee that the winner would be one of them. But the authors don't treat winning a Nobel Prize like a race. They suggest it's like winning a coin flipping contest in which innate talent, culture, and hard work don't matter. If talent and opportunity were equally distributed, they write, the average winner's parent would be at the 50th percentile. Let's say that everyone in the world gets to participate in a coin flipping contest to get 24 heads in a row, which is similar to the probability of winning a Nobel Prize. And the 1% with scientist fathers get two free heads. That gives them a modest 8% advantage and 300 times the chance of winning the contest. The same mathematics applies to the children of scientist fathers having 150 times the chance of winning a Nobel Prize. This could result from a modest 8% advantage in scientific talent and opportunity. The bell curve strikes again. So why would having a scientist father put someone eight percentile points ahead of the pack? The study authors say it's their family's higher income or education. But those are not the first factors I would point to. One key factor is genetics. Though we have not identified a Nobel Prize gene, some helpful qualities for scientific accomplishment, like IQ, lack of major congenital disabilities, conscientiousness, and curiosity are partly influenced by DNA. Another factor is culture, and having a scientist father makes it more likely you were born in an atmosphere that values science. And of course, children of scientists are likely to have more opportunities. According to the study's authors, that's the problem we need to fix. When writing about the paper's findings on X, co-author Paul Novosad quoted Stephen Jay Gould. I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. The paper's authors write, our evidence suggests that there is a large number of missing scientists, individuals who could have produced important scientific discoveries, but did not receive the complementary inputs required over their lives to do so. Of course, it's a worthwhile goal to improve education and opportunities for workers in cotton fields and sweatshops. But the paper misunderstands how scientific discovery works. Just because the children of non-scientists aren't getting their share of Nobel Prizes doesn't mean they aren't making valuable contributions to science or other fields. Scientific progress is based on the contributions and discoveries of thousands of people whose names we never hear. Geniuses are important, but innovation doesn't depend on one individual. We'd have Newton's laws without Newton, we'd understand radioactivity without Marie Curie, and we'd have found the Higgs boson without Peter Higgs. 
Literature is different. We wouldn't have Shakespeare's plays and sonnets without Shakespeare. Nobel Prize winners also aren't always the most productive scientists. Some recipients win for a single insight or fortuitous observation. Often the winners seem to be nearly random selections from several people who publish similar findings around the same time. The paper did show that children of engineers, doctors, business owners, lawyers, and judges were also more likely to win Nobels, although they had a smaller advantage than the children of scientists. Again, that advantage had probably more to do with genetics, interest, and culture than family wealth. The paper suffers from another major problem. The authors use father's occupation to guess childhood income and education, which in turn are markers of socioeconomic status. But these are not perfect correlations. The authors are applying group characteristics to individuals, which is a classic statistical error known as the ecological fallacy. There are plenty of Nobel winners whose childhood socioeconomic status were typical of their father's professions, but there are also plenty that don't fit the mold. Ada Yonath, who won the 2009 Chemistry Nobel, had a father who was a business owner and rabbi, which the authors coded at 98th percentile. But Yonath's father was actually an impoverished grocer who died when she was young, meaning she had to take on multiple jobs to support her family. Harold Jury won the 1934 Chemistry Nobel and was the son of a minister, which also codes his 98th percentile. But his father died when he was six and he spent his childhood in poverty. Linus Pauling won the 1954 Nobel in Chemistry and his father owned a business and was coded at the 97th percentile. But the business was a drugstore and Pauling's father got sick when he was five and died when he was nine. Pauling's practical-minded mother thought going to college was a waste of time. The authors acknowledge this issue, but claim that the Nobel Prize winners in their study were, if anything, more likely to be born to fathers at the tops of their fields. This is circular reasoning. The authors want you to start by assuming their finding is true, that socioeconomic status is a causal factor in winning science Nobel Prizes. Good scientific inquiry doesn't start by assuming what the author is trying to prove. That kind of bias leads researchers to make false assumptions about evidence. It's like a detective who assumes someone is guilty and therefore considers having an alibi as additional evidence against her because innocent people don't need alibis. If you don't assume family socioeconomic status is the main factor in winning science Nobel Prizes, there's no reason to think that the winner's fathers were at the tops of their fields. And therefore, the errors in guessing wealth and education from profession weaken the author's case rather than strengthen it. What the authors of this study are missing is that their data actually show that science Nobel Prizes seem to be more meritocratic than anyone would have guessed. But good news doesn't make for sensational headlines or viral posts on social media.